sermon to do. And we know that a sermon is a team effort. It is an all play experience at Blue Water Mission. Here's your first warm up question. Are you ready? Are you a people person? Are, are you a people person? How many of you are a people person? Raise your hand. Yeah, how many of you aren't a people person? Keep your hands still and don't move. Look really shy. Avert your face. Excellent. Those of you who are people persons, what do you mean by that? Think about that a minute. What, what do you mean you're a people person? <laughs> I should have asked the third question. Am I a people person? Yeah. No. <laughs> yeah. What do you mean? Are you a people person? What does it take to be a people person? Who said yes? Yeah, Joe. Asking thoughtful questions of people. I mean, you're really into what's going on with people. Cool answer, I like that. Yeah, in the back, Dave. You're excited to engage people. You look forward to engaging people. Dude, why are you in the back row? You should be like front and center. Yeah. Loud, loud. Oh, this is brilliant. Yeah. It's a brilliant answer. You're, you're comfortable with yourself so you can share yourself with other people, give to other people. Brilliant, yeah. Socially comfortable, I guess you could say that, but I prefer the way that you say it. That's really cool. People persons are energized by being around other people. And non-people persons tend to have their energy sucked out when around other persons. Oh, really interesting uh, definition. Second question, second question. Is it cool to try to change other people? I get a quick no from Camille. <laughs> I get a quick no from Camille who is sitting all alone in her row. Coincidence? I'm not, not, really, not really sure. No, it's not. It's not cool to change other people. Raise your hand. It's not cool. It's cool to try to change other people. Sometimes. This is highly conditional. I'm not signing your contract, Sang. Oh, now, now, now Camille's backpedaling like crazy. I like to empower people. Not, not change people. How many of you just refuse to answer the question because you're pretty sure it's a trick? <laughs> All right, third question, third question. And this one uh, isn't awkward. Uh, third question, how's your reproductive life? How's your reproductive, Brian, Jen? You care to chime in on this one? Non-existent at the moment, about to get better. <laughs> Beautiful. Chris Ann. They didn't mind telling me telling you they were engaged, but they're starting to mind. <laughs> I, 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 don't, I, I tease because I love. Um, how's your reproductive life? Go ahead and just share with the person next to you. <laughs> no. Non non-existent and proud of it. I, I didn't actually expect you to engage with one another, but I'm very interested as to what the answer is out there. How, how's your reproductive life? Who hasn't, anybody want to answer? You guys are, she, 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 she's doing well. She's 15 years old now. Yeah, <laughs> taller than her mom. That's one answer. You were talking. What would you say? I'm, I'm, I'm fascinated. How, how's your reproductive life? Non-existent. If we're talking about reproducing ourselves as disciples, Larissa says, 
and she's pretty intentional about it. Sure, let's talk about that. Sure. Let's just say that that's what I meant. Good. I set you guys up, you know, because I was asking definitional questions. What do you mean by being a, a people person? And is it cool to try to change others? Like, you know, what are we talking about there? So, of course, the, the, uh, the answer behind the answer is what do you mean uh, reproductive life? And if we're talking about reproducing ourselves by developing disciples or reproducing the life of God or the life of Christ in other people, um, then that, that's a different sort of response, right? So let me ask it that way. How are you doing at reproducing the life of God in other people? How are you doing about reproducing discipleship in other people? How are you doing on bringing people to faith or bringing people back to faith who have drifted into decay? How are you doing on that? Think about it for a few seconds. Because I think that's a, a huge question. How many of you, for instance, have, have uh, participated in bringing someone to faith in the past year? No? You know, fair number, but a, but, but a fair number or not. I think probably the proportion is higher than that because a number of you have participated in it as members of a, of a team, you know, a team at church. We've seen a lot of people come to faith for the first time. Why is that an important question? You know, why, why should we try to change others in that way? Um, um, why should we try to be people persons uh, in, in that fashion? Well, if you believe in eternal life and eternal not life, then that is like, you know, the most important thing that you can do in this world, right, is to plug people into life-giving faith in God. If eternal life is at stake, then that is of infinite importance because eternity uh, is infinite. Of course, if we're talking about reproducing the life of God and other people, and you think that godly people are a blessing to the planet, it's also important in that fashion. We have uh, a culture today <coughs> in this country that I would say is a virtue signaling culture. We've gotten really good at signaling our virtue, signaling our moral positions on certain questions uh, that are of political importance uh, today. So signaling your virtue is really important. Like I would say 60% of all um, you know, like headline social media posts are about somebody like, you know, signaling their position on some political moral issue. But while we have a culture that is rampant in virtue signaling, uh, we have a culture that uh, is really against preaching of all sorts. This drives me insane. I can't turn on a television news network without hearing somebody preach. It's not the news anymore, it's just preaching. But of course, preaching Jesus is incredibly insensitive and bigoted. Why is that? I'll tell you why it is, because the world hates God. Jesus said it 2,000 years ago, and it has not changed. And the older I get, the more I know that it is true. It is true. <clears throat> and so the older I get, the more committed I get to preaching the truth of God and to a culture and a community that has completely lost the taste for it and devalues it now. Rhetorical question. You don't even have to answer this one. What is it that we're trying to do here at Blue Water Mission? Well, we're trying to do so many different things, right? But ultimately, the one thing we have to do is reproduce. The one thing we have to do is reproduce the life of God and other people, is to create new believers, new followers of Jesus Christ. Reproduction is, is, is the essential goal of like, you know, any species on earth. Because if they fail at that one mission, well then, the species fails entirely. <coughs> Reproduction is also the essential goal of any society, because if, if societies don't reproduce, then they go extinct uh, really quickly. In the kingdom, in the community of faith, uh, reproduction is our essential goal. And if we lose track of that, um, then, then we end, we end. 
But more specifically, as to the purposes of this sermon series, if we fail to keep track of our goal to reproduce new life in other people, we end as a person. I think we get stuck in our faith journey <laughs> in a way that rather quickly leads to stagnation and decay. You have to keep in mind that you are a reproducer or bad things happen to your spirit. And that's what I want to talk about today. We're in this sermon series on the whole race, A to Z, uh, the whole faith journey. And the sermon series is about knowing where you are on your faith journey so that you know what you have to do in this moment so that you don't get stuck and drift. Because getting stuck and drifting is what leads to destruction. The enemy very, very rarely makes us decide to quit. Instead, what the enemy does is he makes us just decide not to decide. He makes us just kind of drift into the gray. And inch by inch, we lose ourselves. That's how Christians die, typically. That's how faith dies, typically. <coughs> and so, uh, uh, a few weeks ago, we talked about being a seeker, which is often, you know, the first step on, on, a, on a faith journey, and the essential skill of being a good seeker. You don't even know what you think about God yet, but you are seeking. You are seeking. The essential skill of being a seeker is honesty, particularly being honest with yourself, which is an incredibly difficult skill, and then to be honest about what you see and learn in the, in the world. And once you become a good, honest seeker, you never want to cease to be a good, honest seeker because there will always be new things about life and God uh, to learn. And then we talked about believing because if you seek really well, ultimately that leads to believing. And um, the essential skill of believing is deciding. And this is, again, something that our culture tries to prevent us from doing. We want to keep our options open. You know, all choices are valid, that sort of thing. That's a big part of our culture. <clears throat> but to really believe in something, to really have a belief, a committed belief, you have to get good at deciding. And that's a muscle that a lot of us have to learn. Thank you. It's really sounds worse than, than it is. It doesn't hurt. But thank you. I'll pop one in. <clears throat> Making strong and definite decisions in life. That's something that we have to get really good at. And saying no to however many things necessary so that we can say yes to the one thing that counts. Uh, then once uh, <clears throat> you've decided to believe, you have to live it out in faith. You have to live the life of faith. And the essential skill of faith is trying. You have to try things. You don't think about things, you contemplate things. You try things. You need to participate in the things of faith if you're going to live the life of faith. <coughs> and then last week, uh, Julie talked about changing, about changing yourself uh, in particular. And what is the essential skill of, of changing? Well, uh, as uh, Julie uh, presented it, uh, you need some appreciation of the old you and the new you and the old options and the new uh, better options. And to sort of carry some awareness of that and to cultivate that awareness, particularly through a life of prayer and interaction with God, a vibrant life with God means you let God change you. You let God change you. Uh, she spoke of the renewing of the mind or the daily re renewing of the mind. And the essential skill of changing is consistent renewal with God. And today we're going to talk about changing others <coughs> and what's the essential skill of changing others uh, for the better. What I want to do with people is I want to make them self-feeders. I want to give you an independent, robust life with God. How do I know when you become an independent Jesus follower, an independent Christian? How do I know that you've become that? Well, it's when you start to reproduce. If there's one thing I want to do in this life is I want to create other Christians who create other Christians. I want to reproduce reproducers. Only if I manage to pull that off is my life complete. That is the essential missions. Speaking of new life, I hear one. 
in all of its glory. Excuse me. Thanks to Eddie for my tea ministry. It's a lot of life out there. Um, reproduction is the skill. Reproduction is the skill. You want to reproduce the life that God has given you in other people. And if you're not reproducing, you're going to get terribly stuck. Uh, Jesus started his ministry with a bunch of commands about being reproducers uh, in the world. About the first thing he said was, go preach the message, the kingdom of heaven is near. <laughs> the first thing he told his followers to do was to, was to go create followers. The first thing he preached to his disciples was the need for them to go preach. When he called them, when he called Peter, James, and John by, by the seashore, he says, come, follow me. I'm going to make you fishers of men. Whenever Jesus calls someone, he calls that person to a purpose. And Jesus was very clear about the general purpose to which he was calling all of us. He says, I'm going to make you fishers of people. I mean, your job is to gather other people into the boat. You know, and, and he just gave a zillion teachings <coughs> on the very same topic. So many that would be, you know, probably impossible to list them all today. Um, some, some of the famous ones. You know, the parable of the seeds in the soil. The kingdom of God is like a farmer that goes along scattering seed. He scatters it everywhere, just hoping that it will take root. You know, and some seed lands on poor soil, but some seed lands on good soil. And it takes root in the good soil, and then it grows. And after it grows, what does the seed do in good soil? You know the parable? Tell me. It reproduces 30, 60, 100 fold. It, it reproduces. That is the mark of taking root in good soil. If the kingdom is taking root in you, if you are good soil, you will reproduce. Basic Jesus teaching, the parable of the seeds in the soil. You find that in different places in the Gospels. <clears throat> he says... In the, in the kingdom of God on earth, the shepherd will always leave 99 sheep to go seek the one sheep who is lost. The most important person in any church is the person who is just entering for the first time. Jesus says there is more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who has repented than 99 who have no need of repenting. It's always about the new life, you know? And you know, I think that's the mark of any really good community. I mean, it's, it's nice to celebrate Steve's 40th birthday. Well done. You made it. We had our doubts. But here you are. But, of course, that's nothing compared to a new baby being born. Right? It's like, no offense, but Steve would be the, Steve would be the first to agree as a dad. You know, there's, there's nothing quite like that. It's the new life that is the most celebrated life. Um, in any <clears throat> community. Uh, I could go on and on about Jesus' teachings, uh, but he was constantly on this theme. The Apostle Paul put it this way. I've excerpted a text from 1 Corinthians chapter 9. It's in your program. It's going to be up here on the big board. <coughs> you can follow along in your Bible. Paul says to the Corinthians, Though I'm free and belong to no one, I have made myself a slave to everyone to win as many as possible. Just pause and think about that phrase and how entirely uncool that phrase is. I have enslaved myself just in hopes of reproducing some life. I've become a slave. And he was saying this in a culture that actually knew slavery. This was not an intellectual statement. I've, I've made myself everybody's indentured servant. Everybody now gets to boss me around just in hopes that by doing that, by lowering and humiliating myself in that fashion, I might be better able <coughs> to win 
people to faith. To the Jews, I became like a Jew to win the Jews. To those under the law, I became like one under the law. Though I myself am not under the law. So as to win those under the law. To those not having the law, I became like one not having the law. Though I'm not free, I'm under Christ's law. So as to win those not having the law. To the weak, I became weak to win the weak. I have become all things to all people so that by all possible means I might save some. That word save is the Greek word sozo, restore, heal, cure, bring to life. I do this all for the sake of the gospel that I might share in its blessings. You want to share in the blessings of the gospel according to Paul? Do anything and everything, I mean seriously, anything and everything you can do just to bring people to faith, just to reproduce the life of God in other people. And there is no extreme that this man would not go to to do that one thing. And indeed, he went to the extreme of getting killed for it, uh, as did um, almost all the original apostles that generation. <clears throat> there are lots of great reasons to try to reproduce spiritually, to try to create disciples in the world. Love is a really great reason. It's a great way to love people because if you can help to give someone the gift of eternal life, that's a pretty good gift and it's a very loving thing to do. Uh, there's this idea of the greater good. I mean, the more, the more godly people uh, we produce, um, the better off the planet is, the better things run, uh, the more loving and generous uh, society is going to be. Obedience is a really great reason uh, to try to create disciples since, you know, Jesus commanded us to do it over and over and over and over again. You know, it's, it's nice to be obedient to the Lord. Uh, but technically, in the, in the frame of this sermon series, <coughs> We're interested in how to make progress on our path and to not get stuck in life. And focusing on creating disciples is a really important ingredient to not getting stuck in life and not drifting in your faith. If you fail to reproduce, if you fail to, to stay on target, stay on target, as was said earlier today, then, then you kind of have two main choices uh, in, in your faith walk. Number one, you can become addicted to weakness pretending to need more training, pretending to need more healing, pretending to need more maturity before you can reproduce new life, before you can try to win people to faith. You can disqualify yourself from it. But to disqualify yourself from it, you have to lie to yourself. You have to tell yourself that you can't pull it off, that there are good reasons that you can't be involved in that yet. Uh, that's what I mean by addicted to weakness. You have to, you have to convince yourself that you're too weak. Now that's a great way to get stuck in life. That's a great way to not try to change others by not changing yourself, by not trying, by not deciding. You know, it has this retroactive, retrograde quality that ends up diminishing you and you get really stuck in your faith walk. The other thing that you can do is that instead of becoming a reproducer, you can always become a critic, which happens a lot in faith communities. I've been around faith communities most of my life, so I see these patterns. Um, instead of reproducing disciples yourself, you can instead simply criticize how other people can do it. And that seems very fulfilling and exciting. Uh, and it's a good way to distract yourself from being a creator. Instead of being an artist, be an art critic. It's almost as good. Instead of being a creative person, critique what other people create. And it gives you the illusion of being a creative person yourself. Instead of being someone who reproduces and brings life to people, just point out how other people are screwing it up. And it makes it seem like you've got it down. Right? And so humans engage in this sort of behavior um, all the time, <clears throat> just like the Pharisees did in the gospel. These people that followed Jesus around and just dogged him. And it's like, you know, he would do a miracle. He would raise somebody from the dead. He would heal somebody. And they'd be like, um, excuse me, you're healing somebody on the Sabbath. 
Nah, it doesn't seem very godly to me. You know, and just to appreciate Jesus' frustration. It's like, everybody's a critic. I just like did a miracle that saved a life. And you're critiquing my timing? You know, and he'd have these arguments with the Pharisees all the time. Well, this sort of spirit invades churches and invades communities, and you see it a lot, and you can make that choice if you want to. You can become a critic. You can become a protester. You can become a conscientious objector, or you can become a, a, a form of critic that is perhaps the most dangerous. You can become an expert. Oh, that can be really toxic. Uh, in the kingdom of God. Jesus was very clear the kingdom of God does not belong to experts, which is why he gave it over to a bunch of mostly illiterate Galilean backwoods fishermen to start it off. Please don't ever become an expert. Become a participant instead. Please don't become a critic. Become a creator uh, instead. I could talk more about that, but I think you get the general idea, right? If you're not involved in it, Ultimately, your only option is to become a critic of involvement, and that can get you stuck really fast. These are the sorts of choices that can stagnate you. Now, let's talk about how you go about doing it, because <coughs> I don't know what images are going through your head when I say reproduce the life of God and other people, reproduce faith in other people, create disciples. You don't have to be some super solo evangelist or street corner preacher to pull it off. You just have to join the effort. The thing that we're most trying to do at Blue Water Mission is to kind of be reproductive, is to create life in the world and to gather people into the kingdom for the first time or to bring them back to a place that they've wandered from. Um, we're trying to do that together. You know, you can join the team because, hey, Teamwork counts. You don't have to do it all by yourself. Paul put it this way, and he was talking again to the Corinthian church about how it works. He said, hey, you know, I planted the seed. Apollos watered it. Apollos was this other traveling minister. I planted the seed. Apollos watered it. Somehow it worked out, and you guys became believers. I planted the seed. Apollos watered it, but God has been making it grow. We're all on God's team. So neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything. If you were writing today, it's like, you know, neither the one who plants or the one who waters is any big thing, but only God who makes it grow. The one who plants and the one who waters have one purpose. They will each be rewarded according to their own labor. For we are co-workers in God's servants. You're God's field, God's building. We're all contributing to that harvest. You don't have to preach on street corners, no. But perhaps you do have to be super welcoming at church on Sunday. Maybe you have to like, you know, identify the person who is brave enough to be walking into church for the first time. Maybe you need to keep your eyes open and being like, that's awesome. I'm gonna go love on that person best I can right now. I'm going to welcome them. I'm going to show some, what, engagement, interest. You guys gave pretty good people, person answers earlier. I'm going to get them a cup of coffee. You know, they're going to they're gonna sit by me. I'm going to, in some fashion, try to be ohana for that person. Maybe that's something that you can do. Or maybe you can be super welcoming in your ohana group during the week, you know, so the new person that shows up doesn't feel kind of alien in the group. You want the sort of community that creates life, not the sort of community that is hard to enter. I remember this guy uh, back when Sony and I were first starting out in ministry together. We were like, maybe like 22 years old or so when we were leading our first home group together, our first Ohana group. Uh, this was like right out of college where we had met. We weren't even married yet. And uh, so we started this Ohana group in my living room uh, in East Palo Alto, California, which was a really, really violent 
ghetto at the time. Like, it was not uncommon for our small group to be interrupted by the sound of machine gun fire in the streets. Like, really, it was that bad. Uh, week after week. And there was this guy that started coming to the group. He was a friend of a woman who was in the group, and he had just sort of heard about it and just sort of came, I think, because he was bored and because it sounded sort of fun and interesting. Um, and there was, you know, frankly, an element of danger in just showing up at our group. Uh, and, and the group, you know, just kind of grew that way, and it got to be about 50 people. Uh, his name uh, was Norin, and he was a... <clears throat> had been an atheist. He was a Jewish guy. He's a professional musician. Ended up playing the viola at my wedding. And he, he pulled me aside one night and he said, Jordan, I just want you to know that somehow I find myself believing in God now. I've become a believer. I, I've become a Christian. You know, and I, well, God bless you. You know, that, that's fantastic. And he said, I'm not sure how it happened. But somehow, being a part of this group just made me feel life. And I thought, that's God. I will follow him. You know, sometimes it can be just sort of subliminal and smooth like that. It's life that begets life. In fact, life is the only thing that can beget life. Paul made a big deal about teaching that, you know, the law, the rules, knowledge never reproduces life. But life does. And if you have an Ohana group that is full of creative life and everything involved in that, and who can define everything that's involved in that? I mean, who, who even knows? But you know it when you experience it, don't you? And even a non-believer will know life when he or she experiences it. And that can become reproductive like that. Sometimes the best way to, to impart life is just to have a place that's full of life, just to have people that are full of life. And then the quote-unquote preaching becomes gloriously easy, and the deciding becomes easy, and the trying and the participating becomes easy. That's what you want in your Ohana groups. That's why we have Ohana groups. And that's what we want in church on Sunday. And that's why we run Blue Water the way that we do. Just, I'm hoping that people can get indications of life on this planet <laughs> uh, by walking into Blue Water Mission and seeing the various things uh, that we try to do. Uh, so maybe you want to be super welcoming at your uh, Ohana group. Maybe you want to be invitational at work. Just, hey, we got this great thing going on at church. Why don't you come participate just to get people exposed to life? Because that's a great way to get the reproduction flowing. Uh, maybe you have to take an interest in people around you daily. And if that's being a people person, maybe you need to be more of a people person in that fashion because I hear that people are important. You know, I, I'm not naturally a people person. I don't get charged up by being in social settings. I don't necessarily even like people. I gotta be honest with you, I'm more of a dog person. <laughs> but I love people. I love people. So I figure out how to get it done, right? I recognize that people are important and they're fascinating and they're glorious. And even if they wear me out, they're just nothing like humans, nothing like them. So I take an interest. Sometimes you just gotta take an interest. You gotta, what was it, just ask, ask insightful and provocative questions. I think it was Joe who said that. Yeah, because they're glorious, you know, because they're awesome that way. Maybe, uh, so maybe you learn to ask provocative questions. Maybe you learn to ask people discipleship questions. What's a good discipleship question to ask people? And if you guys don't have an answer for this and you're a Blue Water veteran, you should feel very ashamed right now. What could you ask someone in an office or a classroom or over, over the backyard fence? What, what's been important to you recently? Fantastic. Yeah, what, what, what's given your life value? What special thing is going on these days? 
boom, you have just started a significant conversation, Jason Coide. You're a people person. Fantastic. Now reproduce. Engage and let it flow. Uh, maybe you want to host a Matthew party. Maybe you actually want to create situations, create parties for people to invite other people to, you know? Humans have been reproducing that way for ages. It's the whole concept behind the singles bar. It's to create parties to invite people to. Let nature take its course. Yeah, human species has been milking that one. Maybe you want to, you know, <clears throat> maybe you want to do something like join, you know, cakey ministry with little ones who are just entering into the life of faith and help create an environment that produces lasting faith in kids who are just coming up into it. Fantastic, fantastic. But you gotta, you gotta have something going on. I know you're busy. I just don't want you to miss the heart of the Christian life and, and to then start to feel stagnant and get stuck and respond to the inevitable, inevitable dissatisfaction that comes as a result. There are many great ways to minister in a, in a thriving church. You know, tons of things that you guys help with just so that we can have a meeting like this. Ultimately, all of those things boil down to trying to reproduce reproducers. You know, if you're helping stack chairs at the end of service, you are doing that ultimately to reproduce reproducers. That's, that's the goal, and you, and you can't lose track of that more than anything else in the world. I'm trying to empower people to be the sort of person that reproduces life. The life. The life that leads to life, the only sort of life that counts. Because if we fail at that, we fail completely. That's the heart of it all. So uh, the way I measure whatever the kingdom efforts are around here, ultimately, has to do with their contribution to, to reproduction. You know, and it can be a long causal chain. How does doing the paperwork in the church office lead to saving lives? Well, it does. You know, it does. And teamwork counts. And I thank everybody who participates in any point along the chain. Um, I just want everybody to understand what it is that ultimately that chain leads to and what it is that we're trying to do. And to encourage you in the way that you interface with people in your life to be reproductive, to be engaging, to be a people person in whatever fashion you can pull it off to try to be creative and not just a bystander or, heaven forbid, a critic or something like that. This is a ministry in which we all are involved. It has to be. It has to be. Uh, that's the kingdom of God. And I'm always asking myself, am I helping people find Jesus? Am I helping people find Jesus? Or am I just getting in the way? Am I just another opportunity not happening for them? Or am I actually helping people to find Jesus? So I just wanted to ask you that question. Those of you who are followers of Jesus and have been around Blue Water for a while, let me just ask you. I'll give you eight seconds to think about it. Are you helping people find Jesus? Now, when I ask that question, how many of you receive it as sort of a burdensome thing? It's like, oh, actually, that makes me feel burdened. Let's be honest. Two, three people. We have three honest people at Blue Water Mission. No, it doesn't need to feel like a burden. When I ask the question, are you helping people to find Jesus? How many of you feel a little zing of excitement when I ask it? 10 people. How many of you just didn't drink enough coffee this morning? One person. 
over the years, I can tell you that when I ask myself that question, I actually, I actually get a little zing these days. It's just because even if I'm not very good at helping people to find Jesus, um, I, have, I have creative appetites. You know, I, like, I kind of, I want that so badly, you know. And I have so many models, you know, for how it might work and what sort of communities beget life and work. You know, mostly I'm a community builder. That it does energize me, even though, you know, naturally, I'm not a people person. Um, I don't, I don't want to get uh, in the way, you know, of, of finding Jesus. I think finding Jesus is actually rather easy. Now, following Jesus, that can be challenging. But I think finding Jesus is, is rather easy. And uh, all my time in China, I did like, I don't know how many ministry sessions, and only one session did anyone storm out, which for me is kind of a victory on these trips. Um, and I was talking about grace. And I told the story, many of you know, uh, we were at a baptism service at Magic Island, which is where we usually dunk people in the ocean for baptism. And I was just about to get in the water and, and a woman that the justice team had befriended out on the street, uh, a working prostitute came because she heard there was a baptism service. Some of the team had befriended her and she had felt loved and she showed up at the service. And just before I got in the water, she said to me, Pastor, would you be willing to baptize me today? And I was like, yeah, <laughs> I'll do that. You know, that's why I'm here. And she said, no, 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 you don't understand. I want to get baptized because uh, I'm, I'm kind of liking what I'm hearing. But I want you to know that right after I get baptized, I'm going to go back out on the street tonight and work. I'm going to go sell myself because that's what I do. Now, are you still willing to baptize me? And, you know, and of course I said, yeah, totally. I'm willing to baptize you. Uh, even though you tell me that you're going to go back out on the street and sell yourself tonight. But I want you to know something. I want you to know that after I baptize you, when we invite the Holy Spirit to come, your life might change in ways that surprise you. And she said, deal. Uh, so we waded out into the water. And of course I dunked her. And, and uh, you know, some of you know who I'm talking about. Uh, she started to work at, at Seed Restaurant, probably became the most famous employee there, gave her life to the Lord, is a, I think a preschool teacher today, and, um, and doing great. Um, should be easy to find Jesus. Should be easy to find Jesus. Easy to engage. And I just love providing that opportunity. You know, and, and if you're here today and you're still in that seeker stage, I hope that you find Blue Water Mission to be an easy opportunity to find Jesus. I hope that you felt life here. I hope that you felt creative force here. Do not resist it. It's everything. And for those of you uh, who, who want to get in on it, who want to get in on the reproduction of making disciples, uh, you might fail sometimes, and so try often. Try all the time. Uh, try daily, and that's the way to do this thing. That's how we change the world, uh, by trying to change individuals all the time. Well, Holy Spirit, I pray that uh, you'd come again on us this morning and that you would impart life. The first thing you said to Adam and Eve was, be fruitful multiply. I pray, Lord, that you would speak that word over us, that you would give us multiplication in our lives, uh, that you would give us life and, 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 and new life, revival, life again. I pray that you would give us a rebirth and a lots, of, lots of born agains, Lord. I, I pray for those who need to be uh, reborn this morning that this would be day one for them fall upon us Holy Spirit in Christ's name Amen